All right. We okay. are back on episode 20. Whoa. This is episode 20? 17, 18, 19, 20. Yeah, we're on 20. Episode 20 Crazy. of the Nate and Co. podcast. The support has been absolutely amazing from everyone watching and listening. Um, again, just leave comments and about things you'd like questions and stuff you want answered from either of us or guests you want on and subscribe to the channel like the videos today's episode is brought to you by polar monkeys cold plunges i often find myself deep diving into techniques tools and products that elevate our daily rituals optimize performance and enhance our well-being and let's talk about cold immersion for a moment polar monkeys is the is at the forefront of merging style with functionality when i say they create the coolest designs I'm not just referring to temperature. Polar monkeys, cold plunges are also art pieces. But it's not just about looking good. It's about quality products at a fair price in a market that can sometimes seem prohibitive cost-wise. Polar monkeys stands out with its commitment to fair prices and quality. If you haven't yet experimented with the benefits of cold immersion, from boosting mood, mental clarity, and focus to better sleep and recovery, now might be the time. For listeners of our podcast, Polar Monkeys is extending an exclusive offer. Head over to their website, polarmonkeys.com, and use the code COA and Nate for a special $100 off your order. So dive deep, refresh, rejuvenate, and make a statement while you're at it. Thanks to Polar Monkeys Cold Plunge. A big shout out to them for supporting the podcast and, of course, for making cold plunges not just a ritual, but a statement of style and accessibility. I was just yeah. looking through our last podcast um, at exactly that. There's a few questions from the f watchers and viewers and listeners. Um, we'll get to those in the podcast. For now, we're celebrating a very important moment. Big, huge day. A momentous day. We spoke about... So I was just reading some of the comments. It was hilarious. It was three months ago. And one guy says... Koa, congrats on the breadstick. So we, you must have said, like, I think we're going to be able to do the breadstick. Oh, yeah. I said it a long time ago. Yeah, like maybe it had yeah. been starting to come about. Koa actually successfully convinced Paisel to do the breadstick model. And I'll let you explain uh, yeah, so, what happened. So we convinced Paisel months ago to do the, or you guys did, the fans and viewers watching through this channel and This Is Living and pretty much just any surf channel. But uh, we convinced them to do it and created the surfboard and we sold out the limited run he gave us in like 30, just over a day, I guess. It's crazy. Pretty much yeah. 24 hours sold out 20 boards. Crazy. That's 20 surfboards. Like custom, not cheap surfboards. A lot of comments were like, dude, they're too expensive. I'm like, I... It's just what they cost, and then shipping and stuff. So it's like I was baffled. The mark, the markups. Yeah, you're. We're really baffled because we never have to buy. We don't know. Boards. We don't know. So we're but, like, wait, what? Well, and then that's just the cost of it. When I was it. doing the deal with Paisel, I'm like, dude, these are too expensive. He's like, dude, this. If we don't sell them for this, we're not gonna be a brand. We're not gonna be a company. Yeah. Like we're not. They're not making tons of money. They're just selling a lot. So that's how they like stay afloat and kill it. But yeah, it went well, and I was just on the phone with him. He's like, he's like, let's do more. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> after two years of convincing, no five, <laughs> wow, five years, and then I was like, we can do them if we can sell them in Europe and Australia. He's like, fine, whatever you want to do, you can do it. And then so now we're gonna do another drop soon, probably. We'll keep you guys posted here and everywhere else. That is so sick. Um, so Europe and Australia, drop. you guys will have access to those. Soon, because this was just U.S. based, or this was this was only America? Yeah. So, but ha like when you go through your website analytics, you can see where everyone is trying to buy it from. Yep. And like the third, like a third of the traffic was from Australia, and like a fifth of the traffic was from Europe. Like That's all, crazy. All so the around people Europe. were going to the site, and then they're like, "Shoot, I can't get it." Yeah. yeah. I think a lot of people were going being like, oh, that's too expensive. Yeah. But people who buy surfboards and stuff mm -hmm. know, like, they're just, they're just they're just a lot. I kind of felt bad, like, that's just what I had to sell them for. Because I couldn't, like, undercut anyone else's price, you know? Yeah. So it just turns out to be kind of expensive. 
They're expensive but to they're, make. But they're worth it, dude. You want, it's expensive, but you're getting a brand new custom surfboard with your name on it under the glass from a very renowned shaper that me and you ride his boards. Yes. John Florence rides his boards. And not just that. Like, So this is like... Obviously, there's models Pizel has made um, that John was a big part of creating, like John, my brother, and that John Pizel made. Um, and they were, you could call them signature models, but like many times, Ko and I have talked to him about models. And like this model, for example, the breadstick is something Koa helped design. You came up with, like, hey, this is the board I really like. Yeah. This is the one I ride the most. I want to be able to offer this to people who are watching my channel and want to ride what I'm riding. Yeah. And that's what the breadstick became. Exactly. It's a signature board. Like, it's, it's so, sick. It's so sick because my favorite model before this one was the Shadow. And yep. I was like, I want to, like, do, like, a little tweaks on the Shadow yep. and make it the breadstick when it was like, oh, we can do it. But he's like, tr like the Shadow's sick, but majority of people who are going to buy surfboards in, like, the mainland or here want a little more like user friendly. Mm -hmm. Like the shadow is a very high performance board. Yep. So we kind of did a cross between the shadow and the phantom a little bit. And I used it and a couple other people tried it. And I was like, holy shit. Like, I think maybe I need Psyched a little more how it, foam. Yeah. And stuff. <laughs> I was like, this thing's so responsive and like skating in little waves. That's so, so fun. Um, yeah. I was, I was really curious on to see how like, I was going to be able to sell, like, how it was going to look for me to sell a shortboard. Yeah. Because I'm, like, I'm, we're known as, like, the big wave yeah. pipe guys. But, I mean, we do well. I, I do good enough on small waves. But I was, like, are people going to buy this board? But, uh, yeah, the video came out and everyone just bought it right away. Yeah. That's and it. it's more just, like, you're able to connect yourself to a board and as a fan or people who are, you're their favorite surfer or you're the person they watch, they want to be able to check out and feel a board that Ko is riding every day. And I just saw, was reading something on like one of the other podcasts we talked about Dane having his signature boards and he even had, even having like huge, uh, signature board contracts with his shapers. And someone was saying, they worked in a surf shop when those boards came out. Like the, it was the dumpster diver was one of them. Oh yeah. And something else. And because Dane was doing his mar Marine layer or whatever it was, he had his little production company. He was putting out a ton of those edits at the time. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. That was, he was really sick. Huge in Ventura mm -hmm. and California, like massive at that time, just at his peak surfing as good as he's ever surfed. And people were like, no one thinks they're going to go out and surf like Dane, but at the same time, you're like, fuck, that's my favorite surfer. I'll ride whatever he's riding. I'll take what he's having. And yeah. those boards hit the shop, and they just sold out, they said. Yeah. Sold out. Regular people, they just want to ride what the guy they like watching surfing is riding, you know? Yeah, even, even if they don't surf to the ability of Dane, which no one does, but yeah. if you even get... If you just... You know what it's like sometimes when... Like you grab one of your brother's boards. Yeah. Do you ever feel like a bit of a difference in how they like, when the ones he's working on and stuff, like the new ones? Yeah. Because I've rode one that was like too big for me. It still felt like crazy. I'm like. Crazy because. Holy shit. Like it can get you a little bit closer and a little bit more progressive. 100%. You know? Because those guys know to, or like even just pro to amateur, like there's questions you know to ask. John's a great example. Dane's a great example. They know they're so in tune with the board and in the making of it. There's questions they know to ask, tweaks they know to make that get made into those models that you may never know to ask. Yeah. When you go and order a custom board, maybe you, oh, I want a, I want a short board. Okay, what do you want? Uh, you know, like those guys are like, no, yeah. this is exactly what I want. I need you to take this much off the rail. I need you to do this to the tail, like do this four to the rocker. Centimeters, volume, like, tweak it this much. And so they create a template for a board that works incredible. Yeah. And if you just tap, are able to tap into a little bit of that, you might be surfing better. It's true. So it's yeah. cool. Yeah, I think um, Paisel's always been so against like making signature boards. I think this could have maybe opened his eyes to maybe like you 
and a couple I hope other so. people. That would be so fun. We could do a slab model. That'd be so sick. Well, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see what actually happens. <laughs> we'll see here. what actually happens. <laughs> we'll see, but we'll start selling them in Australia and yeah. Europe and stuff. That would be sick. Did you see? There's a massive swell going to Indo right now. Yeah, it's stressing me out. There's me too. It's stressing me out like crazy. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I'm like, isn't I, it? Isn't the season supposed to be? ending it's already should be i mean it should be winding down but it's just been a weird season right it was slow to start in indo then it pumped with three or four back to back and then it went dead again and now the biggest one of the season pops up and i'm sure a lot of people are kicking themselves because i think a ton of people kind of like spent the wad on going for those original swells which is like things we start to think about like <laughs> hey everyone already blew their trip <laughs> is there going to be no one there? Yeah. And then you start thinking like, well, shit, if there's going to be no one there, it's going to be big. Like, do I have to be there? Like, yeah. yeah, probably should be there. But then you're like, do I, do I uh, spend that money and fly 40 hours across the planet one more time after doing it? Like, it's I went to Africa a- twice this year. I'm like, <laughs> plane rides are just, I mean. How brutal is being inside of a, Little compressed air can flying thirty five thousand feet above sea level. It does it's something radi- to your radiation body. Radiation poisoning or something. I mean, it, the, look, these are first world complaints. <laughs> From the yeah. outside, we I understand. You will say, "F you, you're getting to fly around and chase the dream." Yes, hundred percent, we are, and we know that, and we are definitely appreciative of the life we get to live. Besides all that, there is a freaky thing that happens when you do that amount of flying. You literally are poisoned, possibly by radiation. You're a little too close to the sun up there. The air is a little too thin. <laughs> the recycled air. It's all recycled you air. You do not feel good. No, you. F- it's like a different type of shitty feeling. 300 humans in a metal box burping and farting. Oh, and you're breathing that recycled air. Not so being sold. You're doing it. Uh... I'm going to Indo. <laughs> this is one of those... <laughs> <laughs> Jack's telling us get more positive. <laughs> it's yeah, okay. Well uh fuck, what was I? I was just Nobody likes something. airplanes, okay? But okay, we would no, no, like no, an airline no. sponsor so we could maybe get up to first class that'll make uh, our trips much easier. I think we've brought prepared. up how bad airlines are in every podcast. We're pretty <laughs> They're not gonna sponsor us out of that one. That deal's not coming. <laughs> but uh what was I gonna say? I was just gonna say something. It was um uh, oh you know when you travel so much and you like are so content on being where you are at that moment that a crazy swell pops up and you are trying to break down the swell not to find what's good about it, but to find out why, like a little detail of why you shouldn't go. Like, oh, the winds look a little weird right here at the peak it's of the swell. So maybe <laughs> I shouldn't so go. Funny, Whereas dude. when you're amping for a swell, you're looking at swells. You're looking and you're for like, every reason to go. You're like, oh, it's going to be good enough. We'll get like a... A few hour window, even for if sure. it's on shore for a little bit, we'll get a few waves. Yeah. No one will be out. Like everyone will go in, then we'll go back that out. That is so funny. I totally operate like that too. But maybe I mean this thing could downgrade. I mean, look at the wind; it's not perfect. Like, yeah, I don't know. You're like, <laughs> no, just I'm just cruising I'm still in your right new house. You just, yeah, <laughs> That's yeah. It, but it is true. Everyone was in Indo for like months and months and months. Yeah, and then. Everyone just left, and it does look like the biggest swell of the season's showing up. Yeah, and there's right now. It's I don't know. So that that it, the season has been crazy. There's even like t- all those hurricane movements. There's like um, all the East Coast boys are gonna score. They've been scoring. Yeah, I was like, just writing people about that. Those guys are gonna be so fired up on that, and you have to look at it like. Many years there's been, oh, this is an El Nino, or this is an El Nino, and this is what it does. And then, da, da, da. Yeah, this year, yo, yo, yeah, this is yo. the first year I've seen, like, hey, this El Nino thing could they literally be legit because it is pumping like so many swells, Africa, yeah. the whole Atlantic, Indo, Mexico, Porto. How many days of this season was Porto 15 foot? Pumped all year long. The points were pumping all really? year long. Yeah, I haven't even thought about Mexico. I haven't seen anything Mex- either. Mexico. I don't really go on like. It's been pumping. It has. Mm-hmm. Part has been fifteen feet this whole summer. 
pretty much like a lot of the summer. It just was when Bromley hit his head. And oh, yeah. You think Gnarly. like, okay, like this kind of momentum. Last year we had a terrible season in Hawaii besides the that week of the mm-hmm. Eddie and the shootout. After that, it just went like dead, like so uncharacteristic. Whereas the winter before, we had 45 days of pipeline. That was the craziest thing I've ever encountered. I really am curious to see if we get the El Nino season we saw when we were just getting into big wave surfing nearly. We've probably spoken about it on here before, but like what it was 10 years ago when we seen... Jaws back to back to back. Is that what you're talking about? Outer reef swells, 20 foot swells every other Wednesday for the entirety of a winter. Yeah. Oh, I, th- I think we're really due for that. And supposedly with whatever El Nino is, like the water warming up, it's going to happen. But I'll believe it when I see it. You know, it's like one of those things. Totally. Like, there's a lot of swell going places right now, but is Hawaii going to be good? Because that's kind of what I really care about is getting like sick waves here at home. I'm just looking at it like, oh my gosh, like just been so active this summer. Uh, I'm just like, (laughs) just to go straight into Hawaii if it does that again. The end, at the end of this year, I am going to be a sun dried tomato. Dude, I'm just like so, yeah, you're going to be, you're going to be shot. For months. My adrenals are not going to exist anymore. Your skin isn't going to exist. You're going to need a skin transplant. You're going to need a full body. <laughs> I'm going to need, what do, they, what do they call them in that show, Altered Carbon? I don't know. A new skin. I'm going to need a new skin. A new skin. Sleeve. A new sleeve. I'm going to need a new sleeve by the end of this winter. I went from the back break to just... Non stop swell chasing, and then it goes into El Nino season North Shore. Nate's feeling burnt out. Yeah. <laughs> and these workouts you've been putting us through that are could rough. Be too. That could be part of it. With Nate, we've been hanging out for the past few, like a week now, and Nate's put us through a couple workouts, and I just, I was doing so good up until <laughs> we started hanging out. Now, today, I did like, it was like a f- four minute workout. <laughs> Literally, it was, the workout was based on how far you could get. I got four minutes in, and my legs felt like they were going to explode. Granted, I haven't lifted weights or like done any leg cardio in the past two months. So I'm making a little bit of excuses Yeah, but you're here. 170 right now. That could be why, too, because I put on a little weight, and it's not all muscle. Mass against <laughs> mass. You should have been stronger. Well, Your back spot looks good. At the, we worked up to a three set at... 205 and all of us did three pretty not easy but it was no i i skipped me and jack skipped 205 because the one before it was like getting pretty rough like i kept my form good there but i was like if i go up any higher jack was looking like he was gonna go forward the bar was gonna go this way (laughs) on his back (laughs) spot i was like i wanted to like be like no straighter up (laughs) Bail out, bail out. <laughs> I don't work like that. <laughs> this is this yeah. is a repeating cycle. I come home, the overall fitness of the team rises. <laughs> Everyone gets fitter and fitter. I leave, and I come back, and the crew has gone to bodybuilding, and then <laughs> I have to build back the cardio with yeah. everyone together. Now, here's what happens when you leave. You just don't see it. Everyone's energy levels are way higher. <laughs> Everyone else is looking a little better. Everyone's having like really good days and not ruining them at 10 a.m. in the morning. Like Jack's today. He's like, my day's done. He's like, I can't see straight. Jack's oh, also oh. drank a lot of alcohol. Oh, yeah, yeah, true. But he always does. Um, my vision today, this is the first time this has ever happened to me in a workout, at least this soon in a workout that I can ever remember. It was, we went from the assault bike, which is the full body bike with your arms and legs. Mm-hmm. Ma- like you have to just go as hard as you can pretty much till 15 calories. And then you get off of there, grab the 45 pound dumbbells, put them on your shoulders and do 15 squats within two minutes. And then you keep doing that until you fail. But today in whatever round I failed in, I got off the bike from going like super hard. Well, first of all, after round one, I was like, we were talking. And you're like, I'm like, what if you just like hyperventilated to 
get your ox like oxygenate your body. And you're like, yeah, that'd be a good idea because you don't want to gas breaths. out. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so like I had like 45 seconds until I had to start the next round. I was like hyperventilating, like <sighs> like crazy. And then I do the bike and then I get off the bike. And I go to pick up the dumbbells and there's like a white sole on my shoe. And all of a sudden the, around the white sole, like a, a sketch around it is a bright blue layer and a bright red layer, like the old 3D glasses you <laughs> used to put on. And I was like, whoa, that looks funky. And then I like pick the weights up. And I'm like, maybe it was just a one-time thing. Do a couple squats, look down, it's still there. I'm like, okay, I'm feeling kind of lightheaded. I just put the weights down. I was like, I'm done. I can't you do it. You were just about to go super saiyan. I was, yeah. You were, you were evolving <laughs> through the workout. I needed a sensu bean. You were on. <laughs> <laughs> sensu bean. You were on round two of the workout. Yeah, I was on round two. <laughs> two gave rounds. Up. I gave up because I was worried I was going to just faint. Okay, so any of you out there who work out, we're going to tell you the workout and you can test yourself on it. Yeah, I'm bad at explaining. So you, you, you tell them. No, you explained good about how you were feeling. We'll tell you the workout, and you tell us if you feel the same or as terrible as we felt in this workout. First, we back squatted. We just worked up to a heavy three on back squat, three reps. You can do that or not do that. It's on you. The workout itself is the assault bike, the, the rogue assault bike or whatever it is. If uh, Most of you have probably heard of it. It's an evil bike. Um, and so bad. Dumbbell worst, worst squats. So assault bike cows, dumbbell squats. We had 45 pound dumbbells, two of them just racked on your shoulder. And what the workout is, is in a two minute time frame, complete 15 cows on the bike and 15 squats. And in that two minutes, say you do both those in one minute, you can rest the rest of the two minutes up until at two minute mark, you start again. And at four minute mark, you start again. And so every two minutes, you complete 15 cows, 15 back squats or dumbbell squats with them on your back and until you fail. And that's the workout. And the combination, obviously, you come out of the gate, you start fast on the bike. Of that bike and those squats, you slowly take longer and longer to do them. And eventually, you're finishing in the two minutes at 159 and having to get back on the bike right after doing the squats and just you tell us how many rounds you got yeah what what did you get you got like six ten? no <laughs> six rounds 15 cows five squats jack you had two rounds 15 cows five squats our other buddy jacks had three rounds 15 squats 10 squats koa had one round, <laughs> 15 cows and five squats. Yeah. yeah. And then I just put the weights and I was like, no. And you were like, go, keep going. <laughs> keep keep going. going. I'm like, I, it was the strangest thing because I stopped the workout and then I laid down because I was so exhausted for some reason within the, the workouts bad. But Let it be known you did the first round in 50 seconds. Yeah. No, I was like, I got done with the first round and I was like, Holy shit, I'm so strong right now. And I'm like, yeah, hyperventilate. <laughs> yeah, I gotta, hyper, I gotta stay like stay high. I need oxygen, yeah. more oxygen so I can keep going. Then it was just bad. But I'm glad I stopped because by the end of that, right, my whole quad, this part of my leg, actually felt like it was in so much pain. Like <laughs> just pure pain that I could not even get off the ground. I don't know if you saw me, but I was in the gym, like kind of in fetal position for a moment and then like tried to prop my legs up on something like laying on the gym floor and i was just like i'm like my legs really hurt There's they really hurt evil about that machine combo pumping the lactic acid and then doing squats on it it's not good it was so so bad it was kind of like acid bath feeling you know when you get when you get done with acid bath yeah the pain like takes like a minute to set in and then all of a sudden it just doesn't go away for like 20 minutes. No. That's like what today was, but way shorter. It was bad. I, I don't know if I'll try that one again. <laughs> I got to work my way back up with yeah. my legs because my arms got really strong. Yeah. And my upper body, but my legs are very weak because of my foot. So I'm just like getting back into it. I'm the opposite. My bench is, you guys saw my bench. It doesn't look good. My yeah. bench is super 
freakishly weak. And you know what you're good at when you when we are pro when you're making a workout workout that's like timed and there's like a leaderboard. <laughs> it is the it is only workouts you are good at. I'm no, like, what if we, it's not? <laughs> okay. When, name, <laughs> name a movement I'm not good at. Pull ups. I'll do them though. No one ever programmed Hands workouts. Push -ups. So I'm I've programmed handstand push-ups for us. <laughs> I programmed those for us. Okay, okay. Okay, you're right. You're right. Now that I'm thinking about it, yes. Okay, you're wrong. You're wrong. I'm right. I'm right. You're wrong. <laughs> I'm starting to think more about Indo right now. Remember our Neos trip? How sick it was? Yeah. Like that, or how sick you actually were. But <laughs> I was actually it was a, <laughs> a sick trip in which I got very sick, literally. But I'm imagining. Like, that is the ultimate, like, dream surf trip. You're somewhere off in the middle of nowhere with, like, your best friends in just the sickest waves. I remember some of those days. I would take off, get, like, one of the better barrels I ever got backside, kick out, and then watch you get the same kind of wave. That and then crazy. Eli get the same kind of wave. And then Billy and then Co. Smith. And it was just like, holy shit, like, am I... Is this real life right now? I'm just Days like, like those are hard to come by. But looking at the Cinda swell, that's very high possibility. I know. That's ne what I'm Neos like, is actually looks crazy. Yeah, I'm 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 pretty amped to go do something because I got hurt just midsummer, like ready to go. Yeah. It's so, definitely worth keeping an eye on. I mean, by the time this podcast comes out, you guys will Oh yeah. Have seen whether we even pulled the trigger or not. Yeah. So you'll be listening to this, watching us in the past before the trip happened, debating on going on the trip. We'll talk about <laughs> Whoa. 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 You just confused me somehow. I just fully lost my train of thought. Um, I have a question from one of the fans, unless you were going to say something. Yeah, I was gonna do you guys hear the chickens? I don't know if you can hear the chickens in the background. That's but Hawaii. A huge thing when people come to Hawaii is they're like, they're like, why is there so many chickens all around? There's chickens. You land from the airport. There's just there's there's chickens in the airport. That's so funny. There's that many. I never thought about it. Yeah, as no, being a weird. It is thing. like the strangest thing to people. But I guess if you came from California, you'd be tripped out seeing a seeing a chicken. Yeah, free. But, you know the reason why is because everywhere chickens just get demolished by predators. Uh, but we don't yeah. have any predators. We have All we have predators. is like a house cat here that can or like a mongoose, but they're not really killing full grown no. chickens. Chickens are kind of gnarly. Chickens little are little dinosaurs. Yeah. But I've, I've just these chickens crowing outside made me think of it because all you hear when you come to Hawaii is no matter where you are, is just crowing chickens in yep. the morning. And people are so confused. And then there's like gangs of them on the side of the road everywhere. And That's just so like, interesting. I never, I never even thought about it as being a thing. Yeah. But coming from California, yeah, imagine you would never see a chicken on the road, or even like Mexico. You don't like you don't Sometimes see chickens. Yeah, I guess not. They There's get snakes, eaten. you know, like the bigger cats, kind of. I don't know, honestly. Predatorless. Yeah, there's no predators here for them, and we don't have like poisonous spiders or snakes, which is cool. Very lucky. A little fun fact for you guys, but uh, you had some questions? Dude, let me, ask, let me ask my question. Let me ask this fan's question. Are they about chickens? No, no chickens to do here. Michael Morris, 4182. Thanks for asking your question two months ago. And <laughs> we're going to answer it now. <laughs> we're getting around to it. <laughs> A lot of questions. We've been thinking about it for two months, and we've got an answer for you. <laughs> I haven't heard it yet. Here we go. I would... Uh, oh, so basically... They're asking about toe surfing, and I've seen this uh, this question kind of replicated even in videos where we've done some toe surfing. Um, how does it work with the person towing you, and like what kind of person would you choose to tow you? Is basically what he's asking. Um, do you want their? I'm sure their knowledge on a particular wave has a lot to do with your choice. What other factors? Do you pair up with the same guy each tow session at a given wave year after year, etc. How do you choose your tow partner? Are you towing with the same guys every time? Yeah, I think um, uh, we I we don't really tow very much. Yeah, I mean I can speak for you on that, but um, most of the main like 
tow guys who only tow have their partners. They have a dedicated partner. They have their dedicated partner and their like waves they're going to all the time. And they're just a hundred percent gung ho on towing. Like I see a lot of the Nazare guys, they just got their their team. There's you know? the team that they're year after year the same team. Or, like, or uh, Andrew Cotty and G Mac. Okay. They've been a team, yeah. they were a team for a very long time. Yeah. They compete together and do all that kind of stuff and yeah. Um, Kyle Lenny and Lucas Chumbo, Team mm-hmm. Young Bulls, I think is their name. They're both Red Bull guys. They compete together every year. <laughs> I wonder if Lucas <laughs> came up with that. <laughs> Probably. Probably <laughs> so so like, or Kai. Just so I can see like, Kai going over that. Young Bull. <laughs> but it was interesting because Kai chose to do the Sunset Comp last year. And Lucas competed with another guy. Maybe it was Nick Von Rupp. I'm trying to remember. And I had wondered at the time... I wonder if that would be like a, you know, like a good matchup or not a good matchup, but I wonder if that was like weird for them. Like, oh, wow, you chose another toe partner. Like they cheated on him. Yeah, like something like that because they had yeah, competed together so many years. And Kai chose to do the event. Like Lucas had to choose someone else so he could do the event, but yeah, they ended I'm up sure winning. They, oh, really? Mm-hmm. Maybe Kai was a little jealous, huh? Maybe, but. Uh, Lucas has won that event like every year. And the, the other years one. Kai was there, he won with Kai. So it's So he's just won every year? Yeah, the toe event, I'm pretty sure he's won every single year. They're they they okay, so I'm not the biggest fan of toe surfing. I do agree that there is a time and a place and yeah. a wave for it. But they I'd say those two are very entertaining to watch because even on the biggest wave, like you've seen if they're towing in they're doing like airs down the face and they're doing huge cutbacks or carves or like even just massive chop hops and like flying out the back like 40 feet. Whereas I've they never look, seen other tail guys They do look that. like a video game. They look like a video game. And you're yeah. like, to, I feel the same way. I'm like, if I wanted to watch that, that's what I want to be seeing. Like that, yeah. that is so crazy mm-hmm. on waves of that size and tallness to be doing... Sometimes they do a full rotation chop pop into the drop. Yeah. Like, I'm like, fuck, that's progression. They're pushing it. They're pushing yeah. it hard because, I mean, the other guys are kind of just going straight and kicking out. Like, yeah. They just, one guy looks like he's, like the wave is in total control of him. He got shoved into it and he's just along for the ride. Yeah, they just hang on and they're just like, Hitting the chops like as wide as their straps will let them go. Yeah, and they're just like, oh, like and full then, survival. Whereas yeah. the other guys, they're surfing the wave. Surfing. They are in yeah. total control, and they're actually drawing lines that they choose to. Not, they're not forced into it. They're not overpowered by the wave. They're yeah. carving and pulling in the barrel, and then airing out the back. Like, I totally agree with that. That that they is al- exciting to see. They almost look like. Backcountry snowboarders. Yeah, that's you know, totally they're, they're what it's ri- They're riding those spines. To. Yep. They like hit the spine, mm-hmm. and the, but obviously the the wave is moving and crazy. Mm-hmm. But it looks very similar to I that. I totally agree. And I feel like it's a totally different type of serving. That to me is, if I was gonna watch tow, someone tow, I would like to see guys like that. Yeah. Do it. But going back to the question, like, I and mean, we were on the question. So for like even just us, what we do. Um, and choosing someone like we we grew up here in Hawaii, um, and at some point we we were either borrowing skis or we got ourselves jet skis. And when the big swells came, we would go out together. Like either it would be me and Koa teamed up, or Koa and Eli, and me and John, or John and Kieran, and me and Koa and Eli and someone else, or or however it worked. Um, because we all grew up, we all learned together, and little. Intermission here for you guys. A random person just walked into Nate's yard. And supposedly he is supposed to be here. He's looking at some trees. But, uh... Okay, anyway, we're going back. Yeah, it's talking about the jet skis, us partnering up. We grew up out of reefs, um, and we had to be each other's partner, right? And so yeah, we weren't choosing random guys because we all kind of trained together and we knew like I knew or if I were to choose a guy like I want that guy to be able to come in and grab me yeah I want him to know like I can choose a good wave when I'm towing 
but I also want him to have wave knowledge and positioning. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously, if I think I'm too deep, I might just kick out. Like so, like there is kind of that you do have control on it, whether to go or not as the guy towing, but positioning you do rely on that guy and the speed of what you get whipped into the wave. And you want that guy, like ideally to be a good surfer too. Yeah. If you're a good surfer, then as a driver, you're also a pretty good driver because you have wave knowledge. But on the other side of that, that guy needs to be willing to go into a scary situation and pull you out of it. Yeah. And so we all grew up trusting each other, right? Like I know if I go down, Ko, I'm going to come up and Ko is going to be jetting in. Like he's willing to risk himself to come get me i'm willing to do that for him or whether john's doing safety or i'm doing it for him like i'm gonna go in there and grab you yeah if you're in trouble or if you're just even getting beat down i'm gonna try to get you out before the next wave as quick as possible yeah and as little beat downs as possible yeah that's i think that for me is the biggest part because you see it all the time like even that day at himalayas when me and john I was just doing safety. Yeah. Like, a lot of guys had their own safety. But when you're out there and really in a big, scary wave, even with the jet ski, it's super gnarly. Like, it's scary. You said some of those guys weren't grabbing yes, I, their I picked guys. up people all day once I got hurt. Like, even with a hurt back, I blew my disc out. I didn't know yet. Mm-hmm. But I was picking up people all day. But uh, I've, all I'm really saying is that a lot of people are very intimidated by it, and they don't put themselves in harm's way to save you, yeah. which is exactly what you have to do mm-hmm. when your partner who you've towed in or safety for is in a bad situation. Yep. So I think like there's only a few people I would ever let like be that person for me. It's like when it's going to be one of my close friends like you, mm-hmm. cause like you need someone. I feel like you just have to have someone who actually cares about you because yeah, they're going to go into these waves and put themselves in places that everything in your mind is telling you like not to go there, yep. but you are going to go there because that's your friend yep. and you're going to make sure you're going to get them out of harm's way. Or and you're going to go and that guy needs to know how to go in. Yes. That's a big thing too. Like they need to know how to one drive. One guy might have ski. the balls to do it. He has no idea. Yeah. He, he, he's going to get caught in a wave re- and release the throttle, not knowing that that's how you steer a ski, you know, like, Oh, yeah. I'm stuck. Like, there's just like, uh, you need to know how to climb a whitewater. Yeah. You need to know just how close you can cut it on the back of a wave because if you cut it too close, you risk running the guy's head over you're trying to save or the, swe- the ski getting too bucked in the turbulence because you're right on the back of the whitewater. Like, there's certain waves and certain situations that you just have to read on the spot and you judge that distance and where that guy's going to be. And there's just... Guys that farm it pretty hard. Guys can run right. over other guys or they lose skis and then other skis have to rescue them. And so thinking about it now, you really, if you were to be like choosing and you didn't have, like you would really want to vet the guy you chose. We are fortunate that we have each other in our group because we already know we're all vetted. We grew yeah. up doing it. Yeah, we watched each other learn. We went through the mistakes together. <laughs> like, yeah, I launched twenty five foot off the back away with a koa, <laughs> and I was on the back, and his hat flew off, and I just watched koa leap <laughs> off to the side, and I was sitting on the no, back of the no. ski. No. I, I was like, well, "Wait, I'm, I guess we're jumping. Yeah. Like, I'm the only one here now." <laughs> so you don't get just good at driving a ski right away. It takes a lot of trial and error, yeah. and you got to be in these crazy situations. So. Something like that. We have gone through a lot of trial and error. <laughs> so but that funny. story, I don't think I went off the jet ski. Yeah, you went off after your hat. I kind of tilted the jet ski <laughs> mid air, like, oh shit, my hat. And then you were back there. And when we landed, we landed like really hard, like boom. Yeah. And then you like went flying. Yeah. <laughs> and all our boards went flying. And everything. Then the went the flying. lanyard on the lanyard, uh, hit the kill switch because I like flew too far yeah. and then the jet ski wasn't starting. I was trying to start it and a wave was coming and I just barely got it started. And I think I left you in the whitewash because <laughs> yeah. I had to get the ski yeah, out to just, to and save then come the ski. back. But uh, yeah, it's it's been, there's been a lot of trial and error <laughs> on that. And that's, I think one of the biggest things 
when I, when I'm sitting on a ski and doing safety and watching others go in to grab their people, they go in way too quick or they start from way too far in. Yep. Because when you're on a ski doing safety is a lot different than being on a ski trying to have, get a good shot. Yes, you know? definitely. Because skis are mainly used for driving filmers mm-hmm. in big waves and safety. So driving safety, you don't really want to be as far in as the guy getting a photo because you want to come in behind the wave. And it, the reason you don't want to go in too quickly, which a lot of people just jump the gun on, yeah, is... First of all, you don't know where that person ended up because big waves can move you f- 50 yards sideways yes. like or 100 yards sideways. So you don't know. And you want to give them enough time to pop up so you don't run them over if you just are somehow on their direct path. Yeah. Because you're underwater for so long. So you want to wait till you at least see something like they're bored tombstone a little bit so you know it's attached or like their head just pop up. And then you go in because... That's how a lot of people just get their head split open when guys just whiskey throttle it in mm-hmm. on to their people's heads, and yep. then they miss the guy because it's also like the guy's underwater, right? So he's he's coming up, and he's coming up vertically. It's not your job to avoid the ski if you're underwater. You have no idea, yeah. no idea, and so it's like you said, like that guy's coming from below. You do not want to be flying in on a ski in the vicinity he may or may not pop up or near you, right? Like, so, and then and then on top of that, you're most likely gonna miss him. You're gonna miss him. You have for to give sure. it a little space, and then he's gonna get more waves on the head. So, like that being said, like you want to get your friend out of danger. You want to have someone there that's going to do everything they can to get you. Sometimes involves letting them get one more wave on the head. Mm-hmm. because then you can time it right without missing them, and then they get the entire set on the head rather than sometimes it just being one more to find out where they are, you know? Yeah. Because how many times have you popped up from a big wave, and the next one you have, like, three seconds to get a breath? Yeah, it's over. You're like, there's no time for a ski to grab me. Like, nope. There's no point of going in if you can't see the guy. Nope. And that's a, one of the biggest things that scares me surfing big waves. If someone is trying to help, but they're coming in too fast... Like, that's always a thought in my head. I'm like, is this guy going to be coming in way too hot? Your head is not going to hold up against the hull of a jet ski. <laughs> no, dude. The jet skis now are like 1,500 pounds. It's crazy. Or maybe. And, and that's another crazy thing is the evolution of jet skis. So, like, you go and look at, you can look, you look up Herbie Fletcher jet ski Hawaii, and you're going to see the guy on, like, a single-man ski, like the like the trick skis. He was, like, surfing waves at pipe and stuff, like, going yeah. nuts on it. He took those lake skis yeah. meant for lakes that they would hit their own wake. They'd mm-hmm. do, like, circles and hit their own wake. He just took them in the ocean and went out to, like, maxing pipeline. Insane. It's worth a watch. You definitely should look it up on YouTube, Herbie Fletcher. The Fletchers Fletcher. are a family of just very core ocean-based and land-based action sports like they all dirt biked they all they all like rode crazy huge waves like what a family huh? what a family just the talent like even like look at grace grace is like one Christian of the gnarliest son. skaters we know he's so gnarly and <laughs> so talented i saw nate last night and he's just such a legend we grew up watching those guys do their thing, and there's a lot of the reason why we all turned to big wave surfing. And but they're yeah. so funny and real, the whole family. They're, they're so n- real. They're never going to be fake in any way. Yeah. There's no filter. They're going to say what they think. They're part of that generation that they do not care if they hurt your little feelings or offend <laughs> you. Yeah. <laughs> you know? like It's amazing. They're going to say what they say, Yeah, and you just... Stoked to hear it. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, sick. <laughs> I'll take that. Like, if you're offended, that is your problem. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, the jet skis, they started on those things, started on Zodiacs, like, and to what they are now, whereas, like, Yamaha started to make skis. Um, originally, we had to, like, modify them a little bit, like you would someone modifying their car. Like, we changed the impellers on them to be better at pulling because when big waves break, there's a layer of foam on the water and um, the stock models of the jet skis suck that foam up and they don't get down into the water. And when that's happening, we call it cavitation. 
the guy can literally get stuck at a standstill. He's full pinning on the ski and he can't uh, escape the next wave because it's just pulling foam in. And so guys started doing double impellers and um, shortening the spark plugs because that would give you a faster start speed, jump the ski up, or as you gassed, it would bring the tail down and jump it up out of the water um, to get out of the foam and get moving. And then to now, whereas like Yamaha and even Sea-Doo are building skis specifically for heavy water. Like I think Sea-Doo... Oh, I didn't even know that. Bro, I was just... forget who I was talking to about it. Sea-Doo built a ski out um, with some of their new skis that are heavy water specific, like meant for... No way. Being out in the waves and rougher seas and they made some modifications and even Yamaha like the new ones like they're pretty decked out to be set for that kind of stuff and maybe they just That's they were like could... hey there's a <laughs> look at Nazare look at the exposure look at Jaws yeah. like they see those guys got to there's see what people are using those skis for and there's a lot of surfers taking them out the lifeguard com- like state of Hawaii lifeguards they all have jet skis at, at oh, certain locations in for the rescue world. and everything yeah. And those rescues are predominantly being done in, in heavy water. So it's cool to see the progression of what those guys originally started using them for a flat water lake ski to now they're at these companies are actually possibly building out jet skis meant for big waves. Dude, they were towing guys in on inflatable dinghies with like a <laughs> 10 horsepower engine on the back. Insane. That's how like towing started. Yeah. It's crazy. It's mind blowing. Like the the engine that you'd have to steer like this, like this. <laughs> yeah, I didn't tell someone. <laughs> They're what that in means. forty foot, fifty foot surf. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy where it's gone. Like crazy, man. Those people back in the day were just like, "Yep, let's try it, let's do it." Those guys must sit back and look at like the the <laughs> technology, the gear we have now, and be like. Pussies. <laughs> yeah, Garrett, I was just thinking. They're either like, "Wow, that's cool," or they're just like. <laughs> Bitches, dude. All your we had nothing. I used gear. to surf with nothing. No leashes. No nothing. No float. I remember when pool vests, the inflatable vests were just a brand new thing. We're like, oh, yeah. that's crazy. That's so crazy. We were we would never thought that would be a thing. Yeah. It's kind of cool that we're right. We were on at a that very good generation. Time. Yeah. That we got to experience surfing without it, but we were in the generation that got to get a hold of that equipment and progress to where we are now we were positioned so perfectly to get the full experience when we first started we were out there in board shorts and we yep. dealt with very frightening beat downs in just our trunks and i would never think to go ever surf in my trunks like that like what those guys were doing like it's just the risk is too high at the way we're the way we're surfing and pushing it yep. and then we were in wakeboard vest yeah remember that? The they had padded impact vest because those guys were slapping the water yeah. And we they had they would float you a little better. So we were in like ordering like these wakeboard vests. And then from there, company saw an opportunity, gear got better, people developed. Now mm-hmm. we wear like our full setup is an impact suit with a uh, foam inside to float you with a pool vest beneath that. And so you're geared up to rise to the surface, whether you pull or not. If you get knocked out, you have the impact as a backup. It's also created padding around your body. Um, and if you are conscious, which most of the time we are, you pull and you get shot to the surface like a freaking sci-fi movie. Yeah, it's crazy how much they actually help. I was on the team of uh, like developers for Quicksilver and Aqualung when they were making theirs that they sell now. And it was, it was really interesting to see like, um, the actual like technology and materials that went into it. Because like, even the, from the bladder that they use that fills up with air is like so strong. It's yeah. like this material that's very thin, but you can like, it's meant to be like stabbed and survive. That's crazy. Like not popping. Yeah. So, it was really cool to be on that side of it. They didn't really listen to too many of my ideas. I was really young at the time, too, yeah. so I was like, whatever. But I was there for all the meetings. Learned a lot with um, a lot of big wave surfers. But Yeah, we were it, lucky to have Dorian and, yeah, and uh, Greg Long and them come up with those original ideas. Crazy. And it's such a simple idea, too, because 
the technology is pretty much just the plane, like what's on every airplane mm-hmm. is that pull vest. They just made them stronger yep. and put them in your wetsuit. So smart. And they've been around forever. It was just someone being like, let's do that. So when we're getting beat down underwater for a minute and a half and feel like we're going to die, we'll pull it and come up. <laughs> yes. Which not, not they don't always bring you right to the surface. You get pretty pounded, but they definitely help. Mm-hmm. But then there's a thing too that has come with the territory is just donkeys that shouldn't be out there. Yes. That can't handle beatings and go beyond, like, beyond what their skill level allows at that time. Yep. And it allows them to be out there and feel comfortable and confident to mm-hmm. go on waves they shouldn't be going on and sitting with guys they shouldn't be sitting with, like taking off next to guys they shouldn't be taking yeah. off next to. Yeah, 100%. So, that has been a big issue in the last few years. There is pros and cons. Mm-hmm. Definitely. But the pro is a lot of more people have survived. Yes. So it does outweigh a lot. We have another question. Um, this is an interesting one. Do you feel like you're at the peak of your careers? And do you think about life after surfing? How do you prepare for that? Whoa. Are we peaking? Oh, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm going to be 30 in a couple months. <laughs> You're not far behind. So don't Shoot. <laughs> Eli's 31. Your brother's going to be 31. Yeah. Oh, no. I think peak is going to be a couple more years from now. But then I, the decline seems to be swift and aggressive yes, <laughs> from what this. we've seen. The decline is extreme. <laughs> yeah. I, well, even now, like, I hurt my foot. I've never hurt my foot in my entire life. I'm yeah. about to be 30. and like, you just don't come back from the injuries not, as well, quickly. I came back fast for this injury, <laughs> but I did everything in the book that exists to the do it. The surprising part was being wounded at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't believe I hurt my foot. How like, did this happen? But to answer that question, I feel like my peak is not there yet. I will be at my peak soon because my plan with surfing is to gather enough knowledge, like wave knowledge, to select really good waves so I fall less and get even better waves. Just be more selective. So I think I'm going to get... We're about. I feel like we're just about to reach our peak soon. It's really hard to say, and it depends on, like, the peak you're talking about, right? Like, is it, is it a peak in big wave performance? Is it a peak in sending alone? Is it a peak in career-wise as far as are we going to make the most money we make now? Like, those, some of those peaks, maybe, like, the big wave stuff and the big heavy slab stuff, I don't think it's sustainable, for a long time, I think you have to uh, get smarter, like you were saying. You have to make better decisions. I mean, look at what Dorian did. But his he spent a career on tour. Then he went into big waves. And that could have been like... I mean, he was doing it when he was young, too. He has all that crazy mm-hmm. chokes footage. But he really put a focus on like the his heydays of paddling jaws and stuff. That was like pretty late in his career. The slab stuff, I think there is a peak and it's maybe near. Like it's, I don't, I think that window's only a few years. Um, and when your body, when you can train and get fitter still, there's a peak there. And your reflexes and agility and all that, there's like a window where I think your training becomes maintenance. You don't necessarily get fitter, faster, stronger. You just kind of um, hit maintenance where you don't get slower. You want to like, you know, like it's, that's when you're getting on the TRT. Well, yeah, or, just wait till we get on TRT. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to be yeah. on a peak then. Yeah, yeah, right. We're going to be so. 45, <laughs> just shiny tan and just like revving. But maybe we're not sending like the craziest waves at that point. We're just psyched yeah. to go on fun surf trips, you know, like so there's different peaks. And yeah. financially, I think we're the furthest away from our peak. Well, yeah, I hope so. Because we're both just have <laughs> such, such uh, entrepreneurial mindsets and ideas and the way our we both have made money with YouTube and our careers and surfing and a trajectory on that side of surfing our presence in the media and as a, on social media and all that stuff you just see it in the analytics of what we have on our apps today it's just rising and yeah. so 
there's that physical peak that may come at some point. Um, and then there's like that where your career ages like fine wine and you have those guys that were, they made out really well because they made the right decisions mm-hmm. at the peak of making the money and they were smart enough to kind of like we both are. You, you set yourself up so that you're not totally, re- totally reliant on your body and putting it at risk to make that money. Yeah. And if we can get to the other side of that, I feel like the doors are just wide open for yeah. whatever we want to do. And what does it look like after a career in surfing? Yes, I'm still going to surf. Am I going to go out to pipe every day and battle guys that are trying to make careers? Probably not. Are you going to go around the world three times and <laughs> Am I going to get on a plane every week? Probably not. <laughs> yeah. Probably not. I already feel that part like kind of like the, <clears throat> the drive for that. Yeah. Like slowly, yeah. slowly declining. But like you said, there is, there's different, that's a hard question because there's so question. many different types of peaks. Like you talk about like maybe your best barrel ever. Like, have you got it? We Like, you don't know if that was like your peak. Like mine was when I was 18 in Tahiti. Like I doubt I'm going to yeah top that, you know? Yeah. But I don't even like strive for a peak like that, but that's it, right? You're you're like fuck, like what 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 yeah. would more than that give me? Versus the risk, a the risk attack. of dying is very high. Like, <laughs> yeah. like, like, my heart you know? might not make it through that exactly. one. Exactly. So I mean, yeah, like happiness. Like, that's a great question. What? Being like, happy and your content and happiness. Content like is huge are. because we're tweakers tweakers and you sit around a little bit yeah oh, no i would love to t- take some time off and you sit around for three four days and you're like ah, you know like, like so-and-so's going there yeah and to, someone else is going here and the fomo like, of oh, watching I, other I people go, score go. yep <laughs> like that wigging us out yeah when, when is that gonna end does Mahina, that Mahina end? asks that all the time when are you gonna stop caring if other people are scoring I'm never like, never <laughs> oh that was just like recently i just watched everyone getting barreled i was just like in a <laughs> little motel in san francisco awaiting my f- foot operation i was just uh, like yeah this is rock bottom here but i mean an Looking ideal a chubby like oh <laughs> it's tough fomo is no good for anyone an ideal ideal uh after career life would be still surfing but doing it when and how and where i want and I would love to be able to just travel, surf low key spots, go to places where there's not going to be a huge crowd, be able to make use of the connections we've made across the planet to go yeah. on just fun trips. Just fun, Cruise. like not risking your life. Doing things like you just did with your chicken Oz or I did with my chicken in Europe or in Africa. You know, you get to go in a way more relaxed state, mm-hmm. actually take the time. I got nowhere to be, nothing to do. I'll surf once this trip and be super stoked. Yeah. Because this that stress you put yourself through, just essentially like kind of being your own boss, which is a great thing. But there, it does come with stress because like it's our life. But like when you're like 10 hours out from the flight you're going to have to get on, you're like still haven't pulled the trigger and you got like flights on hold. And <laughs> that is you, not good for your you body. Don't, you don't even think about booking your place to stay yet or a rental car. It's just like analyzing these swells and talking to people yeah. for hours and hours and hours up until like, I've booked flights within like two hours of the flight yes. departing, like on the way to the airport. Okay, booking them. Jack's like, did you get the flight yet? Did you get the flight? I'm yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> totally. I'm like trying like, booking like places when you land like you just it's so it can be so stressful because we just rely on the ocean and swells and tides and currents and wind and temperatures it's like it's very unpredictable things that totally is very stressful on a human can't well it could be worse it could be it could be worse it could be a lot worse well that was answering that question so wait what'd you say that was a, that was our that was answering that question. Oh yeah, I forgot that was even a question. That's what we were, we were Good talking. Good question. About. Good question. And yeah, that's just we you you feel that rush because you do have a little bit of a shelf life if you're a big wave surfer. You got to get it in. Hit yeah, it, hit it while it's hot. And a lot, what a lot of guys did that I like look up to who who were who were like ex pro surfers, I guess, are the ones that built something for themselves while they were surfing to sustain their lives 
after surfing. Yeah. No, it could be anything. It could be a fucking mechanic shop. Like anything mm-hmm. people have done just while you're doing this, like while we're doing this, I am constantly thinking of like, what can I do? What can I create outside of surfing that is going to sustain me for the rest of my life? Because we don't have these nine to fives with like 401ks and like these retirement plans and stuff. So we have to be thinking all the time, like, or I guess we don't have to, but I think that is what separates us from a lot of people because honestly, the thing me and Nate talk about most, probably more than surfing is even like investments or like just entrepreneurial ideas. We literally talk about that more than serving. Yeah. It's like, it honestly has become like a bit of a passion of mine Yeah, to like see other things grow outside of where I started, mm-hmm. you know, like that's outside of surfing. So those are kind of the guys I look up to who have like set themselves apart. Kind of totally agree. And with that, we'll wrap it up. Yeah. Oh, that was episode 20. Episode 20, done, in the books. Wow. Crazy. Good deal. Guys, like, subscribe, YouTube, Apple, Spotify, every other platform you're listening on. Thank you to the listeners. Thank you to the listeners and watchers. We will be back for episode 21. We'll see you then.